Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Senate Education. This is Wednesday, April 17th at 137. We are going to talk PCBs, BOCES, return to school construction. Then we're going to have a walkthrough. Uh, Representatives Conlin and Brady are going to join us at 345 just to talk big picture around uh, their ideas for a commission on education. Uh, and hopefully by the end of the week, we'll be ready to vote school construction at the very least. And we'll have some conversations about some of the other things uh, that are on our agenda today as well. But first off, happy chat. Senator, thank you. Matt Chapman, I'm the Director of Waste Management and Prevention at the Department of Environmental Conservation. And I have two things to go over, and I'm happy to you know, take them in whatever order you would like. One is in response to Denise's questions from our last uh, testimony. And I don't know whether this got to everyone, but there should be a memo from me to the committee. Is that, it? Uh, well, that is something that I, there are two things that you should oh, yes, ask for me. Yes. One yep. is the memo, yep, and the yep. other is the draft legislation. Okay. So, oh yes, we did ask. And you, thing. yes, you basically asked me, and I hope this is responsive to the questions that you asked. But it, mm -hmm. I tried to um, answer some of the questions between what the differences were between screening values and standards, and the difference between DPA standards and uh, Vermont standards in one day. Where are we starting with that one, one pager? Let's start with the one pager and let's just go over it and see. And, and I guess I would, I would, um, and I'll try and share my screen just so we have it up there. So, oh, okay. thank you. Uh, and thanks, Mr. So you should be saying, so So basically, I, as I said, this is a memo prepared for the committee in response to your questions from last time. And, and some of the questions were surrounding the differences between the screening value and standard, right? And, and part of this stems for the committee members who are in LCAR, which I think is just you said our yes. Um, uh, and, and, and basically, a screening value or the RSL is a value that is used to basically screen out contaminants at a contaminated site uh, or identify which things need more investigation. And we basically use that uh, when there's no cleanup value that exists. And so for indoor air, PCP indoor air values, Vermont's screening value is 15 nanograms per meter cubed. And EPA's residential screening value, which is what we would use in the context of the school, is 4.9 nanograms per meter cubed. It's important to know neither one of these values are used currently at schools, right? These, before there were school action levels, these did come into play somewhat. They are no longer used. Um, so if you move down to the next sort of the table, this is a comparison, uh, as best one can compare mm -hmm. between the Vermont screening values and the EPA Tosca exposure levels. So if you look at the top row, you see what the Vermont screening, uh, school advisory levels are. And then the next row, EPA doesn't do it by grade level that you do it by age. So this basically is the rough corresponding age values between students and what the EPA concentrations are in nanograms per meter cubed. Um, yeah, please. Thanks. Sorry, can we ask, can we, I feel like we're not comparing apples to apples. So, um, why is, why is one, table say one part of the table say exposure levels and one say SALs. Because, Are those the same things? Well because that is what Vermont calls them school action levels and IPA calls them exposure. Oh, but they're measuring things. They're measuring PCB concentrations yeah. in indoor air at schools. Gotcha. So 
And I, again, I, this was intended to be help, frankly helpful for you. So if there are suggestions the committee has, and, and I sort of took it as you were like wanting to have a resource to help you no, communicate something. Yeah, so, it's just, so if there are suggestions, I'm so for clarity. Yeah, I would, no, no, Senator, I'm, I'm not trying to be defensive or anything. Yeah, I just, yeah. I, it's more of a, please, I, I'm taking this with a, if there are things I can do to be helpful, yeah, let me know. Yes, just um, want to make sure I understand. Absolutely. So you see, there's there's a difference in values, right? And so why? That's the sort of next section, which is there's two major reasons why. Um, one is, is that EPA is looking to protect the average person, so basically hitting the 50th percentile of people being protected, which means that there will be 50% of people who are basically having unacceptable exposure levels in Vermont avoids that. We basically um, try to protect the most vulnerable set of persons from exposure. Um, and and the other sort of uh, difference is that Vermont accounts for exposure in non-school air differently. And this is probably one of those areas where you really need the health department to explain all of the factors that go into this. But basically, it's looking at um, it's looking at your exposure of PCBs from other sources and, and basically that we look at that differently and use uh, more updated information than what EPA uses with respect to that. Um, and then the last sort of factor is that EPA is relying on 30 year old data when they sat, they, they established the values that you see at the, the EPA exposure levels. And most of the data that we use is more up to me. So I'm happy to like expand on this, but again, I think this is sort of the questions that, that were asked last time and wanted to try and get something, hopefully this succinct. Yes, thank you. Uh, what is, how do you define low sensitive population as compared to the average person? So for the most part, what they're doing is they're looking at, um, again, this goes back to the health department are best people right. to speak to this, but my my generalized and understanding is you're looking at sort of the 90th percentile or sort of the, you know, and I, the example that I was given was EPA is assuming that students are in classrooms for five hours a day and the health department is looking at it and saying, well, wait a second, you have some students that are there for an early breakfast before school starts, and some are there for after school activities. So we want to protect those students for the length of exposure that they're there in uh, the school. How many and, days per year does the EPA assume? Do you know? Now you're getting now. That's one that I feel like okay. yeah, that, that I don't want to get that detail. I think the health. I mean, the health department has. Oh. But they have a memo that's called a derivation memo that they do for all the standards that they develop. And I, I am pretty sure that they've done uh, one for the school action levels. I'm happy to find it and send it to the center. That'd be great. Oh. Yeah. Quick question. So do you know, set of curiosity, when you say the EPA is relying on data that's 30 years old, what gets them to update the same process that we're going through right now all of a sudden? something happens and it's it's a great question i mean you know um it's a long time it's a long time e, you know epa updating federal regulations it's exceptionally difficult mm -hmm. and it um my experience has been that epa does not do a lot of that there are lots of things that i rely on in some of my programs from epa that haven't been updated since the 80s or even the late 70s so, and, and science has flown well past where EPA was at that time. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it, there are friends I have in the environmental movement whose job it is, is to sue EPA to make them do the types of updates that you're talking about. Senator Weeks. Yeah, just to thank you for the testimony. Um, I'm trying to correlate the first paragraph with the data set that's embedded in the middle. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. where the 19 nanograms per meter squared and the, and the 4.9 nanograms per meter squared relate to the chart that's in the middle. They don't. So, and, and this is, this is, it was responsive to your question about sort of like, what are the, the screening levels and how do they fit in? And 
And if I were going to, I would just say as a sort of footnote, if this is something that you wanted to carry to your constituents, I would probably delete that first paragraph only because we only use screening levels when there are no other standards. Because we have standards, we don't rely on the screening levels, right? And screening levels are, are what's the best way to this? I mean, they are, you basically use them to rule out things we don't need to look at. Right. So when we're going into a contaminated site and trying to figure out, you know, it used to have this sort of industrial process going on. And we know there are these types of contaminants associated with that type of industrial process. We'll screen for them and basically say, OK, is do we have problems at this particular facility of those types of contaminants? And if the answer is no, they don't hit, they are not above a screening value, then we won't focus our investigation on those contaminants. So that's Generally speaking, how we need EPA to use strain levels. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. You may not be able to answer this question. <laughs> I've asked it before, but I'll ask it again. To my constituents, what do I say when they when they ask me how the governor can veto a flavored tobacco bill that we know is poisoning nine year olds now, and 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 to the tune of. I, I can't remember what the tax revenue was on that fifty million dollars, and yet spent hundreds of million dollars of dollars on this program. Do you, I, I, I can't answer that question. I just have to ask it because I'm, I'm, I'm baffled, and people are asking me, and I just don't know how to answer that question. Neither do I. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the mystery. These numbers. I think the other thing that came up, and I'm sorry if you've already covered them. The the Vermont school advisory levels, they went through LCAR. They they did. When? When, when did we do that? In February, I believe it was. Okay. The session. Okay. Let's see. Do you love them? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't remember what the question is. But the issue of well, what's higher, Vermont versus EPA, or what's more stringent, that's where that's where this conversation percolated again. Sure. This is like the yeah. third time. In here. And my, I said in Elcar when they were doing the PFAS numbers, I think I mean, you, you get a bunch of science, you folks are in from the agency. It's not, it's more than just attorneys in the room. Each that's every call that day. Yes. No offense to you. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's Number of different, yeah, no, sure. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. So. Delivered process for sure. It is. Should we switch to your exposure? Let's switch. Okay. Um, so the other uh document that I brought to speak to is uh titled the NR proposed changes. It's it's uh, a version of page 73 as passed the house. Um I have uh, taken the time from the last time the committees met to coordinate with the agencies of education, the department of uh, uh, health and the attorney general's office, and then you can say for say these are coordinated comments. Yes, um, and thank you for that. We did reach out to the AG's office, and they wrote back that <clears throat> they have been coordinating with all of you. So yes, it does represent this green light as well. Correct. Okay. <clears throat> and the only changes are the ones in red. The only changes that are the ones in red. I did highlight one area that I was undeleting just to note it. Um, so AG and AG, ANR, uh, Agency of Ed, and, and Department of Health. Oh, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So the first set of changes, uh, as soon as I say that, I'm looking at this and I'm seeing some, the track change is not picking up that. So let me. Oh, you want a copy? Um, that would actually, that's great. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, so the first set of changes is on page three, um, which is proposing. So again, just to orient everyone to what this is, this is the dollar value for what triggers the pause. So when when the amount of money in the education fund reserve goes below a certain number, it directs the agency of natural resources to stop the testing program. And uh, we're recommending that that value 
go from 4 million to 2 million. And, and basically our internal conversations is that we think that $2 million for a, an average school represents a reasonable margin of safety for us to mitigate and manage the, um, the issues associated with PCBs and that we can continue the program to that point um, and be reasonably assured that we can at least mitigate or address things. I don't know a ton about the circumstance, but I do know that there's at least one district that has been uh, tagged by the EPA to, to, to have the two-year fix. Twin Valley, is that right, or Slate Valley? That Twin Valley. Twin Valley. So, um, how much do you have, do you have, do you have any sense of what that is going to cost? So we're having active conversations with EPA about how they're approaching the Tosca portion of these cleanups. Um, I um, I believe that EPA um, ultimately will be taking a more flexible approach to how they approach cleanups and allow uh, PCB-containing materials to remain in place until a construction activity occurs that allows, where you'd be doing work in that area anyway and need to properly dispose of them. Um, this is a national program. It takes some time to work with headquarters and others to change sort of or, or uh, be more flexible in program guidance and more actively work to do that. Um, I do also, I guess, think even within the context of that letter, that the EPA is, um, I think it is possible that even though it says that you can be gone in two years, that um, if they're appropriately contained, that there's a risk management alternative associated with that. So we're hope, we're working on that issue. Right. Awesome. Yeah, but do you, I mean, do you have a sense of like, how much in the how difference? Much and where the money is going to come sure. from? Sure. I, I mean, I think if, the rough approximation of the difference between complete removal versus management of materials, it's about a twofold increase. So if it, you know, it would double the cost, roughly speaking, of the program if everything had to be removed. And you know, so for example. With, and would that be put on the on the local taxpayers? Uh, so according to this bill and the way that we've been approaching things is that the state is going to be paying for the costs associated with the work that needs to be done. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, just mm -hmm. um, a couple of things to, for, I don't know, for, if it's late in the day, so you may not have time to be thinking about this thing stuff. But like, for example, in our personal Burlington situation, um, the removal of the PCBs is difficult. And I worry sometimes about the locations that are accepting those materials. Are this going to be issues with that? Because I like feel like... Well, like, like, like they don't like look high up. Right. Like the yeah. Yeah. So yeah. They don't even go well country. Um, it depends on the concentration okay. of the materials, but like building up, I think, went to Michigan. Yeah, exactly. So I, I, guess, I guess I'm always a little bit concerned about that, concerned about the cost. One of the things that happened with us is once we got down to like the bottom, bottom of the basement in one of the buildings, there were like these daubs of blue that had asbestos in them where it was a whole other cost. Um, anyway, my point is just that it's, it's, this is not easy work. It's not simple work. It's really, really complicated. And I'm all I'm just so concerned about like all these hidden costs that come up. So I I, I just I'm making sure as we look at this bill that the state feels confident that they have the resources to do the work. Well, and, and I I think it's fair, and I think that that Secretary Terry Moore has said uh, we feel fairly confident that we have sufficient funds sort of in the bank to get through the next fiscal year. Right, and, and that we can manage things, and I think there's an acknowledgement that um, there's a need for the administration and the legislature to come together to find a sustainable funding source to finish this process. Okay. 
Do we have any sense of where that sustainable funding source might be? I know well, you don't, Matt, but well, I have to ask it. Favorite. Sure, that. sure. No, I mean that. So that that's the last. Uh, that's the last section that I proposed. Okay. Yeah, so, <clears throat> All right. Ten weeks. Are we simply submit to this senate expression? It's a matter of priority. Good money here, good money there. We just have to priorities. Understand that. Thank you. Great. All right. So the next uh, proposed change is on page four. Um, it's at the bottom of the page, and basically, this was an amendment that was added to the house in the house floor. Uh, if we can pause and not go into depth on this, and then talk about it after the last. Sort of change if we want to come back and sort of look okay. at them compare comparatively. I can okay. speak to why I'm making the change. All right, so we'll skip. So if you can skip that, that, if that's that, okay. And then yep. shift to page five. Yep. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and then on the next page, page five, this is uh, responsive to the attorney general's set of uh, proposed edits. And it, it, it basically just changes that the investigation was not recommended or required by the state but was instead a part of the plan for uh, renovation and they thought that this would address the concerns that the attorney general raised in her testimony this last week oh was not recommended okay. would you say that piece was the sure. thing? Thanks. so so again this is this is when a the state does not pay for the work that is taking place uh as far as pcb abatement or removal and it basically happens when we didn't recommend or require that to happen a and r the state didn't recommend or require it was a part of a a regular construction project taking place okay as a part of school construction work um, and this doesn't apply to the wrong. Right. So, I was going to say that. Right. That's the last sentence of this because I think you're right, Senator. Right, right, this, right. yeah. this is Burlington, right? Like you, yeah, totally. I, uh, where they were going in to renovate, do reconstruction, and PCBs were found. Right? Yes. Well, um, all right. So the the next page is um, on the last page. Okay. Um, so the the first change in on lines three and uh, three through five. So this continues to maintain the requirement that schools test, um, but rather than having sort of a hard date, has it done in accordance with the schedule published by the Agency of Natural Resources? I, mean, I, I think there's a lot of different, I, I think the need to test needs to be there. And I think the question then is like, do they want a date? Do they want it something more flexible so the agency isn't coming back asking for a change in that date, which we could just do via the schedule that we publish? Um, so, but I think, again, having some requirement in a date associated with it was important. And then the last change. Matt, sorry, yes, sorry, absolutely. Hold on. Yes. We see this schedule published by the Department of Yeah, it's, it is actually up on our website. So it's it's basically just saying you need to test in accordance with the testing schedule that we can put up our website. Do you want me to have Morgan? I, I, I can around. I can put it. I can get it. Is it is it more or less restrictive uh to this date here? Do you know? Well see so this one basically says you've got to have everything done by a date certain. Yeah. Right. And this one and the difference is that I guess the alternative is is that you just basically have to do it in accordance with if we have funding and say we're going to put you up for example right and i think uh, to be clear I, I think we're very flexible if yeah. you want to have it be yeah. 20 if you want it to be 27 or 29 that's fine if you want it this was intended frankly to stop the process of us coming back every two years after the defense and funding delays to say hey can you increase the date again so uh, and i think it just it's going to give more time to more flexibility it, it will. It'll allow the agency to tailor its testing schedule to the resources that are available to it so that if there's a need to slow the process down because there is insufficient funding for you to have the flexibility to do that. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Senator Sheep. Oh, uh, it was nothing important. Just if we're going to give language uh, to FEP, line six, last page recommendation to spell wrong. Thank you. Uh, yes. uh, Senator Pugh, did you cover that up before you arrived? Oh, really? Yes, she did. <laughs> but thank you. Great but thank you. Yes. Oh. And so then the, the last section is a set of funding recommendations. It basically requires that both the agency of administration and joint fiscal office provide appropriations, the finance committees, and the education committees with funding recommendations for how to have a long term and sustainable funding source for this program. Clicker, what's the logic going back to page five, line roughly around line seven? What's the logic for, for kind of drawing a line between what what has been pursued by the state for testing purposes and then everything that's found outside of that? I mean, these are schools and PCBs are still found. We're just kind of like washing our hands of it, or or we or how are we gonna react to that? With respect to uh subsection F where it basically says if you if you yeah. We actually will go to the morning. So, so basically what this is intended to say is that if you had to deal with uh, schools today and schools historically, when they've done a construction project, they've had to manage PCB containing building materials during that construction project. Um, and this is saying that we're the state is not going to assume responsibility for the work during a construction project to manage those PCPs. To the extent that you're a part of this program and we're requiring you to come in and test and you find something and now you have to manage it, you didn't, you didn't kind of want to be here, um, but you're finding yourselves here, that we're going to we're going to take for some responsibility over the, the management of, or the payment for the costs associated with that. Yeah, these, the boundaries behind the test program were created by the agency. So yeah. I, when the school was, was not part of that subset, they're not at fault for not being part of your program. So I think it's probably, this is actually probably a good thing to just step one step back away from, you know, a school has the ability, if they're doing a construction project, and several have, to basically raise their hand and ask to come earlier in the testing program. So some schools, rather than doing construction and finding out that they have an issue, have been coming in earlier to do some work. And this wouldn't apply to them in that yeah, instance, right? right? Future. Right. So... Um, I will say this was this was uh, a component that's added was added in the house. It does put a box around what the state's obligations for payment are. Um, you know, I sort of feel it's like it's I'm the guy who cleans things up. Doesn't necessarily come up with the funding resources associated with with how you pay for these things. So that's fair. Can I, can I ask? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Is it, I mean, is this similar to the way um, you know, treat uh, radon discovery or asbestos discovery or lead? So with all of those contaminants, the school would be responsible for managing them as a part of the construction activity, yes. Especially with lead and asbestos. That's so I just want to say I will not be able to support this bill unless we come up with a funding source that is tagged. And I would also like to see how much we've spent. I, I want to see all the numbers, how much we've okay. spent so far, what the outlook is, and all of that. And I, I do, and I have to point out, um, with all due respect to my colleagues um, that I spent a lot of time with in Senate Health and Welfare, I just find it interesting that you're willing to support this bill and the money associated with it when they're you often vote against bills that would improve health outcomes in the other committee i mean i, I don't based, want to based on money and fiscal response quote unquote fiscal responsibility I, sorry i have to i just have to point that out it's 
is relevant. It's germane. The one thing I, I just want to say is some of this, I think, <clears throat> is coming from the direction, as we know, of the Attorney General's office. She was involved. We did hear her testimony. Um, I'll leave it, you know, in, in part given the lawsuit that she's involved, that the state's involved in. Um, yeah, I'm, yeah, Senator. I'm, I'm, so, I want to differentiate between the two committees. We, you know, we need to draw a line, but the good news is that we got everybody, all the players involved in this, we got a problem. The process is agency and natural resources are going to fix it. You know, the, the amendment is going to be that, you know, finance, appropriation, we're all going to identify the money. It's, we're all missing together. I hate to use cliche, but, and the good news is that we're going to set a standard. We're going to adhere to it. Maybe eventually the federal government may step up and come up with some funding that's going to help us to mitigate the problem. But um, I think we need, whether you vote on it or not, I think we need to get it out there. Because I, I hear a lot of schools say, you know what, we got to pay for this. I don't want I don't want to stop testing. That's, I don't want them to stop testing. I think that we need to, for our grandchildren, we need to identify the problem and get rid of it. We can't. So. Mr. Chairman, if we were not to pass this, <clears throat> this hypothetical, mm -hmm. just so I know, then we it's business as usual, but replying business as usual is what exactly? Well, I mean, to some degree, and we're doing a lot of what this bill is sort of asking us to do already, which is managing the number of schools that we're testing and the resources we think we have to deal with them. And this is a backstop and safeguard that the legislature wants to put in place to make people feel comfortable that um, that that our testing doesn't exceed our ability, our, our management resources. And so I, I think the one thing that this does that isn't going on right now is there's not sort of a partner relationship between the joint fiscal office and the agency of administration to come up with a, a, a sort of menu list of options for policymakers to make decisions on what the appropriate funding source is. Um, so that's the thing that's not taking place. I think, I think we need to carry that question a little further. What happens if we don't pass this? So we have a testing program. We don't we don't have a lever to stop it or a trigger that stops it at a certain threshold of fund 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 available funding. So we keep we just keep testing. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, let me rephrase what I said. I'm sorry, Bart. Jen, sorry, Carter. Um, I will support this bill, but I believe that. We need to keep it at four million and not lower it to two million. I just think that money goes like that. I've seen it. Uh, it just seems unrealistic to cut that out. So, so that would be on page um, three, three of the changes. And so, and you know, Senator, I completely respect that point of view. I mean, like that there is, this is a. Um, this is our estimate of what we think a reasonable margin of safety is based on the experience we have going through the projects. I, I don't think Burlington is a good example. No, I know. Uh, I mean, I, I, it's a collaboration to a certain extent. Yes. Yeah, but um, but I mean, I I do think that this is a best estimate, right? So I I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, Senator so, Sheen. Um, yeah. I, Still not, I'm not fully compelled with the, why we're reducing the dollar amount. Uh, I mean, I like the mechanism in general that we have here for this bill. Uh, but also the other part that I'm trying to figure out is what really changes with the, with the proposed change at the bottom of page four. four. Yeah, because it, it, is that just saying that the secretary isn't going to have to do that work, but 
Instead, these committees are going to have to, I mean, the way they normally do, which is figure out how to fund whatever it is they want to fund. So it shifts it. So the agency of natural resources doesn't do taxes, right? So we don't have the ability to do reasonable cost estimates of what it would take to, if you raise this particular tax, what sort of revenue would pop up on it. So what it does is it shifts that not to the committees, but to the agency of administration and to the joint fiscal office. So it basically has JFO working with AOA to look at, and potentially the Department of Taxes or, or the Secretary of State office to come up with a list of options for the legislature or recommendations for the legislature to consider accession. Yeah, sorry if you had that. No, back I didn't. Back. I apologize. I didn't move back to that. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so that, that makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. so, all right, thank you. Senator Fulick, correct me if I'm wrong. You're more interested in an ideal world than a pause. Uh, unless there's unless there's money that can pay for all that needs to be done. I mean, I would love to see every school get tested and remediated. No, I'm right. right. I, 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 yeah, I, it's, it, I mean, you gotta look at the money, guys. That's what you tell me all the time. Look at money. We are. Let's look. Okay. Does it, no, that's our deal. Just because I asked you the question. So, yeah. Yeah. None, I just would like to know where the where the money's gonna come from. There doesn't seem to be a source that's been identified. And I personally think spending two million dollars. You guys, our project is two hundred and eleven million dollars. I mean, you are talking with inflation, big, big numbers. I think this we're gonna fly through this like there's. I don't know. I it just really gives me pause. But I do want to just go back to and the only the reason I asked it was I, the attorney general's concern with the pause was that if we were to pause, you're sending a message to uh, Monsanto and others that we, that this, we've sort of reversed our opinion or position on. Can you say something about that? Because I do think that's a little bit at the... Well, I mean, I, I don't want to characterize the Attorney General's of course. Testimony, right? I mean, um, I think that there is a commitment on behalf of both the administration and the Attorney General's office to do everything we can to see this program through completion. And... You know, and I think in doing that, we're trying to, I mean, you know, we're trying to manage things. I think we're trying to do exactly mm -hmm. what you want to see happen, which is it's manage the work that we're doing to the amount of resources that we have. And I think the the question sort of is, um, when do we when do we stop the flow of new projects coming in, right? And and I think it may be important to just note. You know, there are other sources of funding that can be brought to bear outside of the education fund <clears throat> to do work at schools if the work is happening. There's something called the Environmental Contingency Fund, the fund that my program <clears throat> manages. It can do mitigation and remediation work at schools um, if necessary. Right now, there's, there is funding in that fund. So, um, so there are additional backstops beyond that $2 million. Senator uh, Sheen. Just to follow up on a comment you made, just that we are not speaking for the committee or anyone else, but at least for me, any of my decisions are not the way intended to send any message to any parties in any cases. But moving on from that, I think one of the issues are um, has to do you know, with regarding identifying funding source in the future, I think there's a challenge in, well, maybe not a challenge, I, I don't know if it's even possible to see the next legislature, what they can do with their budget. I, I think, well, I mean, there, I know there's a rule on that, but I don't know, um, you know, what we can suggest or what we have to leave for the next folks. Damn. And I'm just not sure what your first comment then about your indication about <laughs> oh, you, like, you, 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 you made a comment about sending a message to Monsanto, and I'm just saying for me, right? I'm not sending any messages anywhere. I'm making my own right. Message. So I was saying in the context of with the attorney general, and I could be completely wrong that if the legislature and the state of Vermont says, okay, 
you folks aren't taking this. You're, you're suing us because this is harmful. But now you're saying it's not harmful by putting a pause on it. That was what I was trying to differentiate in terms of is that it sounded to me like that jeopardizes the lawsuit. But that's I could be completely wrong from what the attorney general said. All I'm saying is I don't I'm not trying to send a message. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. I think Senator Williams was. Oh yeah, Senator Williams. Wait, no, please go ahead. Senator Williams. Senator Weeks. Um, so I got a question on page three. Sure. Down around the area of line 17, maybe maybe we're um, we should be focusing the, the remaining funds on investigation and containment as opposed to removal. Because removals, I think, where some of the big drug cost drivers are. And you know, is that a compromise that might be more palatable? So that's I mean, and so this is sort of uh the legislative language that augments the memorandum <laughs> that the secretary gave you, but that's that's part of the objective, right? Is to focus our attention on areas that are let's call them primary spaces that are classrooms that are areas where children and faculty are at, um, not ancillary spaces like hallways or bathrooms or closets, right? And then also, um, if we can manage things through mitigation. And it's working. That that's that's a good approach to dealing with some of these things. And then those things where uh, removal is an easy fix and it solves the problem. Let's go ahead and move towards those as sort of the permanent solutions to deal with them. But it's we think we can address the issue just by taking out a set of windows and call in. Let's do that. Um, so, so that's the broader strategy that the secretary sort of laid out in the memo that she provided to you and briefly walked through the last time she was here. And, and so, yes, the focus for the next year is going to be, um, let's focus on the areas that are, are of highest concern where students are at, where we can't mitigate things, where, or where there are good, easy fixes that we can fix the problem. Or it gets tricky when it's in the soils. Or is it a heavy? Is it as heavy as some other things? Or can it be sort of because like peat bass? I know sinks really. I'm just curious if it's or does it say sort of surface level? I don't know that the trans, but it, the transport is very different from any other okay. kind of PCBs. PCBs are actually yeah, I think they're they're more bound than. Um, PFOSs are, PFOSs are incredibly mobile, but, um, but the, the, it's, it's a management cost, yeah. right? It's when you, you end up having to manage PCB contaminated soils, um, especially when they've been contaminated from something from more, that's more than 50 parts per million, I believe it is. Then you need to take them to a PCB certified right. anthem, which, and I should know this part, Keith. Are PCBs for chemicals? I think it's interesting, yes. Okay, they are persistent. Um, yeah, please. <clears throat> this is my last comment. I think um, I'm not. I'm also not sending a message to anyone. Um, and I I do believe Monsanto should pay for the damage that they've done. With that said, I think like holding school districts and tax Vermont taxpayers hostage in the present for a and unknown in the future is, I don't know, is, um, I don't know, I have a problem with it. I guess I have an issue with that because it's just um, creating problems to, that may or may not get resolved by this situation in the future. Uh, that's, and so I don't necessarily see it as a binary. And I would think, you know, folks can understand the, um, the nuance here of like making sure we're not burdening property taxpayers with <laughs> more, more, more and more bills um, while keeping our kids safe, while keeping our kids in school. Yep. You know, there is a, there's a, a lot of moving parts, is my point, I guess. So it's not, to me, it's not like the black and white, the binary. Anything response to that before? Uh, I, I mean, I do. 
just to get, we sort of run through some of this quickly. One of yeah. one of the um, elements in section three of the study is that it it doesn't prohibit. It puts the education fund as the lab, the, the revenue source of last year's work. Um, so on the last page, the last sentence. Um, so the, again, the intent here is to move away from using the education fund and, and using other sources as being the source to address the issue of with these issues in schools. And, and that borrows from the amendment in the House. And I think there's probably global agreement on that principle. So, okay. So, so you, sorry, no, I please, kind please. of follow up. So, yeah, so I, I mean, I think I hear you saying that under no circumstances will any costs be reflected in a school district's budget. So, is that what I mean? no, what I, what I said is so, as far as future funding for how we deal with this program, that the, educa the education funding, the Fed fund would be the last source of funding. So you would need to go through and say there are no other funding sources available. Given the current environment, that's a reality that could come to fruition. Just, I, I just have to point that out. Senator Sheet, please. So I, I don't know if I'm missing something here, but it, I this, yeah. you know, to a previous comment, I feel like this is not holding schools and, and districts hostage when you know it's, if we're creating a potential pause <clears throat> if it if the funds get below a certain amount but also we, we can't bind the future legislature to build a budget when the future legislature hasn't been sworn in and so i'm not i'm not i'm not, I'm not sure what i'm missing here uh, because I feel like this is something that gives schools the chance or you know gives districts the chance to you know slow things down if there are not enough funds and you need funds to do the work. So yeah Thank that's that's just yeah that's helpful. <clears throat> Very helpful. I think we'll close on that comment. Good submission of things. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank Would you, you give me one of those? Can I get the proof? Yeah. No, no, no. no. <laughs> can't, uh, can't, uh, can't, uh, take take one. Take two. Okay. Not even mine. <laughs> Parker, we're going to go off for five minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to Senate Education. Uh, H630, an act relating to uh, boards of cooperative education services. Ms. St. James, uh, I hate to ask you to do this, but given the time constraints that we're all under, I'm wondering if you might give us another high-level overview of this bill to see if uh, senators, uh, and senators, I would say, shout it out if you want to hear from anybody in particular as we make our way through this. Uh, I think we have a couple of witnesses still lined up, but I think there's still, and there are a couple of outstanding questions. I know Senator Weeks talked to me yesterday or mentioned this committee in passing about whether or not some supervisory unions can do some of this work. We, I know the governor's office uh, has been floating a proposal of pushing it out one year. So there are a bunch of other things sort of in the air, but I think it would be helpful for us to go through it high level one more time. Sure, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. So this is the as passed by the House version of H630. There is an intent section. Do you want to skip no, over that? Skip okay. Um, we're gonna jump right to section two on page four with that, which adds a brand new chapter to Title 16, chapter 10, called Boards of Cooperative Education Services, um, or BOCES. It starts with a pause so the section, the chapter starts with a policy section. Um, and I do think it's important to walk through that language just to kind of orient you to the whole bill. So it is the policy of the state to allow and encourage supervisory unions to create VOCES to provide shared programs and services on a regional and statewide level. Formation of a VOCES shall be designed to build upon the geographically focused cooperative regions used by Vermont superintendents as of July 1, 2024, Maximize the impact of available dollars through collaborative funding, reduce duplication of programs, personnel, and services, 
and contribute to equalizing educational opportunities for all pupils. And just to remind you, when we talk about those Vermont superintendents cooperative regions, it's that colorful map that you all. Yes. Um, so the next section is the definition section. Um, later on in the bill, there's several conforming amendments to the retirement system, healthcare system, and collective bargaining systems to allow BOCES to be an eligible employer of folks who could participate in those systems. And therefore, we needed to define, kind of use a pick a term for those um, employees. Um, and so we're going to use the term educator. So educator is used in this chapter means a teacher or an administrator, basically. Licensed by the professional standards board. And then on page five, subdivision two, supervisory union, as you all know, includes, unless the context clearly otherwise dictates, supervisory districts. But rather than spell out supervisory union and supervisory district throughout the entire bill, we're just going to make it clear in a definition section that for this chapter, supervisory union always includes supervisory district. Then um, we're still on page five, line 10, section 603, the creation of a BOCES. And I have um, an outline that I used for myself as kind of a cheat sheet, and I'm going to refer to that to kind of walk us through rather than line by line. Um, so two or more supervisory boards, supervisory union boards, decide they want to work collaboratively together. They get together and talk about the advisability of entering into a written agreement to provide shared programs and services. Uh, and then they enter into an agreement if that's what they so desire. Let me just ask you a question. Again, it's if they want to. Correct. We're not saying do it. Not this bill. If you want to do it. Correct. Great. Right. Giving them the opportunity. Yes, this bill does require everyone to vote on the consideration of forming one. Okay. So everyone but has puts it out there. Mm -hmm. And by the folks that would be voting, who who participates in that vote? Supervisory union board. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um I've already been using the term, but we're gonna now you're gonna see the term throughout the rest of the bill. A board of cooperative education services, we're just gonna call a post Right. And I do think we're gonna change that. Okay. But go ahead. Um, if you know what that change will be. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that'll be a big change. I mean, I'm not. Like, my gosh, it has to change. It just seems like it might be. Okay. Nice to change it. Um, uh, let's see. Our, uh, uh, BOCES shall be a body politic and corporate with powers and duties afforded them under this chapter, right? So if this chapter doesn't specifically give them a specific power, they don't have it. But they are a standalone body politic and corporate. Articles of agreement. The agreement to form a BOCES um, shall take the form of articles of agreement. It must include a cost benefit. Benefit analysis outlining the projected financial savings or enhanced outcomes or both that the parties expect to realize by this collaboration. Uh, question. So cost-benefit analyses, the results of which need to be something in particular or just do one? You could have savings. You may not have savings. It's a cost-benefit analysis outlining the projected financial savings or enhanced outcomes. In order, in that needs to happen in order to form. That should be part of their articles of agreement. Thank you very much. But no articles of agreement or amendments to articles of agreement will take effect unless they are approved by several folks. One set of folks are the members to the BOCES themselves, right? That makes sense. You gotta approve the articles of agreement or member or um, amendments to it if you are a member of the organization. But the Secretary of Education needs to make some findings and approve those articles. So the Secretary needs to find that the formation of the proposed BOCES is in the best interest of the state, the students, and the member supervisory unions, and aligns with the policy that we walked through in Section 601. And that, term, that line there on line 13, subject to the limitations of subsection T of this section, is referring to the limit of no more than seven. BOCES throughout the state. So even if there's already seven, if an eighth BOCES comes forward and says, please 
even if the Secretary of Education can make all of those findings, it's still subject to that seventh limit under this bill. One of the things I'm getting a sense of, the agency, a couple of folks stopped by at lunch. I'm trying to get a sense of how heavy of a lift this would be for the agency. Again, if, if you get one, let's say one happens in the next year, the role of the secretary, I know it's sort of, it's, I'm just trying to get a sense, is this from you, super heavy lift? I, I know it's a hard thing for you to evaluate. I don't think I can weigh in on okay. that. That would be for the agency to take a position on that. Yeah, that's uh, interview. I mean, if I'm reading this correctly, it seems as though the bulk of the work will be done by the supervisor and unions and or their boards. And they're just sort of reviewing it. Yeah, and then at the end, the Secretary of Ed is kind of reviewing it. And so I guess I'm a little confused about that. Yeah, as am I. Emily Simmons is going to testify tomorrow. Um, and I think that's a good question because I, too, don't see this personally as... A heavy one, even if they get set. But okay. It took the bulk of that language from section 709 in Title 16, mm -hmm. which is the um, uh, consideration and approval by the State Board of Education for a union school district. Mm -hmm. So the state board has to make um, very similar findings uh, to improve their to approve the articles of agreement for a union school district. Okay. Um, Okay, so what needs to be in the Articles of Agreement? Uh, the names of the member SUs, the mission, purpose, and focus of the VOSUs, the programs or services to be offered, the financial terms and conditions of membership, including any applicable membership fee, service fees for member supervisory unions and service fees for non-member supervisory unions as applicable, Detailed procedure for the preparation and adoption of an annual budget with carry forward provisions. The method of termination of the VOCES and the withdrawal of member SUs, which shall include the apportionment of assets and liabilities. The procedure for admitting new members or for amending the Articles of Agreement. The powers, uh, duties of the Board of Directors to operate and manage the association, including what are their attendance requirements, what is the consequence for failure to attend a board meeting, what's their conflict of interest policy, and a policy regarding board member salaries. Or something like that. So we're leaving all of that up to the individual voters to figure out. Yep. And then um, they can include in their articles of agreement any other matter not incompatible with law that they think is necessary to form the voters. Okay. Board of Directors. So VOCES is going to be managed by a Board of Directors, which is composed of one person appointed annually by each member SU. That one person can either be a member of the member SU board or the superintendent or designee of the member supervisor union. So for example, if this BOCES is going to specialize in special education services, theoretically, in the universe of possibilities, that board member from the member SU could be superintendent could designate like the special education director to be on the board of the BOCES. Um, let's see. No. Uh, just so when. We're talking about uh, BOCES that might have specialties. In any way, does that limit their kind of ability to do things? For example, because I keep thinking BOCES would be great for purchasing power and get all these desks, everything, might share a language teacher, but you might have a specialty. Mm -hmm. that, well, they, that's decide, they all decide that. They can all do that if they want to do it all. Great. They you. can specialize or they can not specialize. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No, that... No. Oh, I thought you were a panda or you were reaching for something. No, I was going to help not her. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so if you have a backup there. Gotcha. Uh, no member of the board of directors of the VOCES shall serve as a member of the board of director or as an officer and employee of any related for profit or non profit organization. They have to elect a chair and they can decide if they want to have other officers. 
they can establish, and when I say they, I'm talking about the board of directors, subcommittees, and they can create board policies and procedures as they deem necessary. The board of directors of the BOCES needs to meet not fewer than four times every year, so at least four times. Each member of the board of directors has to provide an update on the activities of the BOCES on a quarterly basis. To the members appointing SU board. Yes, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. Um, something just occurred to me, and I may be reading this wrong because I, I just, anyway. Um, no member of the board of directors of the BOCES, down at the bottom of the mm -hmm. page, shall serve as a member of the board of directors or as an office or employee of any related for profit or non profit organization. What if? There's a person who serves on a school board who is on a nonprofit organization that might be somehow related. They cannot. They couldn't serve as a member of the board of directors of the BOCES. Okay. The school board relationship would is fine. Uh, yeah. Would be for the school board to figure right. out. Uh, but this language would prohibit. Let's let's even tease this out a little further. Let's say. There's a member of a school board who sits on the member who sits on their supervisory annual board, who's also a board member at a related nonprofit. This language would disqualify that board member from being appointed to the BOCES board, right? If they were still a board member on that related nonprofit. Right. Okay. I mean, it will definitely limit some people, but I guess hopefully there'll be enough still available. Just no. You know how it is in Vermont. Yeah. And there is, you ask, the this language asks of OCs to come up with their own conflict of interest policies. Okay. So, um, I mean, this language, I would say, requires this to fit into their conflict of interest policy. But if that was something you were interested in taking out, there's already a provision requiring them to come up with a conflict of interest policy. Uh, okay. No, I'm fine with it. I was just kind of thinking through, you, you know, my... Who could serve in? Yeah. Given, yeah. Right. You good? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Page E, subsection D, no more than seven BOCES statewide. Okay. Remember that is a policy choice. Yep. Yeah. And a supervisory union can only be a member of one BOCES, but they can purchase services from as many BOCES as they want. As long as they nothing. Pay whatever is asked. Of them. Whatever is asked. And then each individual BOCES gets to decide do you get a member discount or do non members get charged more? That's up to the individual BOCES to decide. Okay. Um, this subsection E on page eight requires AOE to promote the use of BOCES as providers of education services and programs. Um, and they may designate BOCES as eligible recipients for any applicable federal or state grants for educational programs. Page nine, where are the powers of a BOCES? So if they have the power to provide educational programs, services, facilities, and professional and other staff that in its discretion best serve the needs of its members. BOCES shall follow all applicable state and federal laws in its provision of services, including Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, IDEA, uh, and IDEA, so special education law. A BOCES may employ an executive director who will serve under the general direction of the board and be responsible for the care and supervision of the BOCES. And then the board would be responsible for annually evaluating the executive director's performance and effectiveness in meeting the goals of the BOCES. And then again, here's that same language. The executive director shall not serve as a board member, officer, or, or employee of any related for-profit or nonprofit organization. So the executive director would be an employee of the BOCES. Uh, BOCES shall be a body politic and corporate and shall have standing to sue and be sued to the same extent as the school district. A BOCES may enter into contracts for the purchase of supplies materials, services, and for the purchase or leasing of lands, buildings, and equipment as considered necessary by the board of directors. 
And then that um, language that we talked about yesterday regarding high cost construction bids, as well as lower cost construction bids, section 559 of Title 16 would apply to both. Um, we're on page 10 now. Board of directors of a BOCES may apply for, and I think this was some of the, uh, this language was um, a collaboration between the House Education Committee and AOE before it passed out of the House. So the board of directors of OVOCES may apply for state, federal, or private grants for which OVOCES may be otherwise eligible to obtain funds necessary to carry out the purpose for which OVOCES is established. Nothing in this chapter is intended to create an entitlement to federal funds distributed by the Agency of Education to local education agencies. Right. So that was the, and I think we have represent, uh, represented us here also, LEAs are the ones that are responsible for special education funding. Correct. Can I expound on that? Absolutely. So we don't define local education agency in our state law. Okay. Local, the term local education agency in federal law um, can be a little nebulous. Okay. Um, and that serves many purposes because every state operates differently. They provide education differently, right? So if the federal term for local education agency was too specific, different states may have a problem, right? So um, what this, I believe what this language does is it allow a BOCES to go off and get competitive grants, right? If they are running literacy programs and they want to get a grant to develop a book sharing program, right? Sure. They could go out and get that grant, whether it was federal or state money. Sure. But they could not somehow make an assertion that they would be entitled to any of the federal money that local education agencies as defined under federal law would be eligible for and that AOE is charged with distributing. So competitive grants, great. Yep. Entitlements, no entitlements. Great. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So before you move on, just a question. Can, uh, is there anything inhibiting a supervisory union from uh, adopting the powers that are outlined in the current bill now targeted for a uh, uh The answer to that question is multi-layered. So I think we walked through this when I originally presented the bill. This is a great time to do it again. There is a provision in state law that does allow currently for supervisory unions, and I'm going to want to get the term right, to form joint agreements. It's section 267 of Title 16. What would you call the joint? Joint agreement. So they would not be, remember, a BOCES is a brand new political subdivision of the state. The joint agreement is literally going to be like a contract between two different supervisory agents, right? But, but an SU itself, is there anything inhibiting them from, for example, they, an SU is a, uh, has the Spanish teachers that are delegated to different districts, different uh, individual schools. Is there anything inhibiting them from doing that now? No, but that one SU would be on the hook for that contract. Right. And then they'd be relying on everywhere they've allocated the 0.2 time for that Spanish teacher to pay them back. Okay. Okay. That that could happen. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to keep going? Okay. So no longer. Yes. Page 10, line 8. Section 605, financing, financing, budgeting, and accounting. So BOCES has to establish its own account, its own fund, where all of its receipts go into and all of its money's come out of. They have to have a treasurer, and they um, will appoint a treasurer, and that treasurer can be a member, uh, a treasurer of a member school district. Right? So if someone's already specialized in doing a great job in this world, you can tap them to also be the treasurer of the BOCES. The treasurer 
uh, would may subject to the direction of board of directors receive and disperse all money belonging to the board without further appropriation. Treasurer has to keep financial records and make them available. Uh, they have to make sure they have a blanket bond to cover the treasurer, just like in a school district. And then a board of directors has to, the BOCES, each individual BOCES, I'm on page 11, line 7, has to decide for themselves if they're going to pay the treasurer for their services. And then the treasurer gets evaluated. BOCES is required to use the uniform chart of accounts that supervisory unions already use. Um, BOCES are required to undergo an annual audit. Uh, consistent with generally accepted governmental auditing standards. And they have to discuss and vote to accept that audit at an open meeting. And then the BOCES board has to transmit a copy of each of that audit to each of its member SU boards. BOCES has to prepare an annual financial statement, including net assets, statement of revenues, expenditures, and charges in net assets. And changes in net, sorry, on page 12. They have to adopt a budget. They may take out loans. And then there's some language limiting that. So uh, they, they're not to exceed the difference between the anticipated revenues for the current fiscal year for the budget. And they're not credited to date to the budget in order to pay current obligations. And the total principal interest fees to be paid on such a loan cannot exceed the total amount of the authorized budget to the same length. Yes, no. So, thanks, sir. So, if I could again, uh, how how do these financial uh, responsibilities or opportunities differ from NSU supervisory? Is it is it quite different? Um, I don't think there is anything this specific in state law, it's usually the school district that is doing the majority of um, an SU's budget. It's just gonna be a line item on a uh, school district's budget. Um, so I don't, I think that would be a question for the field on what kind of loans they're taking out. Page 12, line 11. Annual report. So the BOCES has to prepare an annual report. And that report has to include a minimum information on the programs and services offered, including information on the cost effectiveness of such programs uh, made towards achieving the objectives and purposes set forth in the articles of agreement. And the audited financial statements and the independent auditor's report. BOCES has to maintain an internet website, including a list of the member uh, members of the board of directors copies of approved minutes, copies of the articles of agreement, and copies of the name of the annual report. Uh, page 13, line eight, employment. So BOCES is considered a public employer and may employ personnel, including educators, to carry out the purposes and functions of the board. Annually, they have to conduct an area survey of the salaries of educators and staff employed by the BOCES member SUs and school districts. So, Sure, distinction's right, but they're not AOE employees, they're the, just public employees. Yes, and if we walk through the rest of it, you'll see there's different pieces of law that would apply to different categories of employees. So, um, first, a BOCES is not going to um, employ someone as an educator unless they are appropriately licensed by the standards board, and that's the same requirement for, SU, or for uh, school districts or public schools. And then C through G are the provisions that are applying p different pieces of state law, making eligible, making both these employees eligible for different pieces of the system that currently exists. So subsection C says that a person employed by BOCES as an educator, I'm on page 13, line 17, a person employed by BOCES as, a, as an educator, so a teacher or an administrator, shall be a participant in the state teacher's retirement system. And then there is a provision that amends the definitions in the state teacher's retirement system later on in the bill um, so that it's clear that BOCES is an allowable employer for participation in that system. 
page 14, person who's employed by BOCES who is not an educator, so all of the other staff that make schools go round, they participate in the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System if they are eligible. And this language says those same folks, if they're employed by BOCES, can also participate in the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System. And then there are conforming amendments to 24 VSA Chapter 125 to make that possible. Line four on page 14, educators, so teachers and administrators employed by BOCES shall be entitled to organize pursuant to chapter 54, so collective bargaining. And the same on line six for employees who are not educators. They can form, um, they can collectively bargain pursuant to the labor chapter or the labor title 21. And then both educators and employees who are employed by BOCES shall be provided health care benefits pursuant to Chapter 61 of this title, which I always forget the name of that chapter, and that is uh, the Commission on Public School Employee Health Benefits, so the statewide bargaining for health insurance for folks in the school system. And then there are, again, conforming amendments for C through G to make mm -hmm. all of that possible. Yeah, just going back to the line A, Paragraph G. So is, that's not, is that any different from um, supervisor union, no. district, et cetera? So it's my question really is about like the part time versus full time. Uh, there's a lot of para educators out there. The way that's written, any employee is entitled to. I'm wondering if that's, that's new or if that's just pro form. No, the way this is actually written is that they will be eligible um, pursuant to that chapter. So if they weren't otherwise eligible under that chapter, being employed by BOCES would not sweep, sweep in extra people. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so that's it. We just walked through chapter 10, which is the BOCES chapter. So everything else in the bill is either transition, session law language, or those conforming amendments to make all of those um, collective bargaining, retirement, health care changes um, possible. So transition, I'm on page 14, line 10, on or before July 1, 2026. So two years, this bill is gonna take effect on July 1, so two years from effective date. Each SU board has to consider and vote on the desirability of establishing a VOCES. So they gotta get together as a board, talk about whether or not they wanna pursue this and then have a vote, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's all that's required of them. If they vote yes, then they have to hold an organizational meeting on or before July 1, 2027, so a full year after that vote requirement. And then on or before July 1, 2028, AOE has to survey the field, figure out what's going on out there in the land of those seats, and report back to you all on or before November 1st, 2028 with information and recommendations on BOCES. So how many BOCES are out there? Who are they made up of? And what are they doing? What are the services they're providing? I'm on page 15. Yeah. So that is another task that the AOB will have. A report back, yes. So you know, it's, just, it's a report back. So it's just trying to gauge the level of uh, work that with this bill place on that. That's like the fourth. So okay. Thank you. Yeah. So to that point, they vet all the votes up front. But before like now they, they have like nominated votes from SU. <laughs> they vet they vet they decided no more than seven. Then they begin the transition process. And with the proposal. Yeah. I kind of, um, it's an amalgamation of the bill. Um, so by July 1, 2026, each supervisor union board has to decide if they want to even consider forming FOCES. Right. Once they make that consideration in the positive, if they move towards actually forming a VOCES, let's say three get together and they're like, great, here's our articles of agreement, then AOE has to approve those articles of agreement in order for there to actually be a VOCES. 
Um, so AOE is reporting back on the number of BOCES in existence on July 1, 2028, the names of the member SUs and the services that are provided, and all that would be in the article of agreement um, or in any amendments. Uh, the number of supervisor unions that are not members of the board of, the, of cooperative education services. And that this report back does require AOE to report on why such SUs have not joined a board of cooperative education services. And then the report back is a, re a requirement for recommendations for the expansion of membership and powers of BOCES, including recommendations for whether membership in such boards shall be mandatory. So what, what's AOE's recommendations for the future of BOCES? Section four is a startup grant program administered by AOE. Um, so, BOCES are eligible for a single $10,000 grant after AOE approves the applicant's initial articles of agreement. And the division here is that grants are used for startup costs. And that could include reimbursing the member SUs for any work or costs incurred while they were exploring the formation of the BOCES leading up to AOE approving those articles of agreement. And that appropriation of 70,000, because there's only seven that can be formed, is coming out of the Ed Fund. And then the rest of the bill are those conforming revisions I talked about regarding retirement, um, collective bargaining, and healthcare, making it clear that a both cease is a, an acceptable employer for its um, employees to take part in those different systems to the same extent that school districts and SUs provide those benefits to their employees. And then the effective date is July 1, 2024. Thank you. Yeah, helpful uh, bring this right back to the issue. For me, it'll be interesting to hear from the agency tomorrow in terms of timing. I open and interested in the dates, but um, if people are really concerned about getting uh, all this work done, we could consider pushing them out. So I'm open to that. I'm also interested in learning more about the education blueprint that the house is gonna talk to us about, see if there's some way that this should be incorporated or, or not. But um, those are just two, things that I'm just thinking about. Senator Shane, please. Yeah. Um, I guess in balance, you know, I, I'm not, I don't really want to push the idea out. Uh, you know, there's, there's an urgent need to rethink how SUs will work together uh, when we consider the cost, especially. Uh, but, you know, the, on the other side of that, I think, uh, you know, I, I had mentioned a little while, I think in the last time we talked about, you know, instead of doing the seven all at once, you know, just having that, you know, one at a time right. system, yeah. uh, which would, you know, the, yeah, just doing it that way instead of having to worry about seven applications coming at once, which, yes, would be a lot of work. Uh, but, you know, maybe we could do the one at a time application, but not push the data out. That's uh, my thought. Yeah, they're Under that, we would allow, have you, I'm not putting pressure or putting on spec, have you thought out how we might, how that one might do it? Would it be sort of first come, first serve? I think just in the order of receiving, receiving. You know, okay. So, yeah, I guess first come, first serve, and then, you know, they, you know, just, do a systematic and standardized process for each one. And I mean, if there's, you know, if they, yeah, to the first one, you'll, you'll realize, oh, this is, you know, when, when we're going through the administration of this, this is an area where we have to, you know, shore things up. Yeah. And then, you know, they can come back with a recommendation maybe uh, for next year or, yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Kuhl. May I interrogate my colleague? Uh, no, but you can. <laughs> can I ask him a question? No, please. Yeah. Um, so, if Senator, you so choose it. yeah, Senator Hashim, if you'd be so kind as to expand on 
what you're saying in terms of um, one at a time, which to Senator Campion's point has been called an equity issue, who gets to go first. But the other one is when you talk about doing one instead of seven because you want to minimize the amount of work, can you expand on that in terms of like what work? Well, if, if the you? complaints from AOE, well, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but if, if the complaint is that they're worried about the amount of work all at once, and instead of doing seven BOCES at once, they're doing one at a time, then, you know, I think that, mm -hmm. that, that, that could be the solution. Or, I mean, and additionally, you know, if there's, they're doing, you know, a wholesale seven BOCES all at once, and then they realize, oh, there's actually an issue, but now there's seven BOCES as opposed to one with an issue, it will be a lot harder to fix whatever that issue is among the seven votes right. as opposed to fixing it among the one and then keeping it in mind for subsequent votes. I hear that. Can we, for my own edification, can we just make really clear what that work is that the AOE has to do? Because maybe I'm not understanding, but I, I there's a report. I, I, I see that. There's a report. There's... And I bet they're going to bring a lot of that tomorrow. Can Ledge Council... Or maybe um, Representative Bus can, because I maybe I'm not understanding something, but I don't see that the uh, agency event has a lot of work. I mean, a lot is a the undefined term, but anyone? So let's go. The districts have a lot of work for sure. Yeah. I don't do you want your Yeah. It's going to be the approach. Oh, I don't want to. What? Representative Bus, do you want to say a few words? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so it is the districts that do the bulk of the work together because they're creating that agreement. This, these are minimum standards so that they there could be more information in that agreement. Um, so AOE would just be making sure that the agreement um, holds all the minimum criteria that is laid out in this legislation. And then they would uh, look at geographically where that BOCES is located. And then they also uh, include in the report is the reason why the folks that decided not to join the BOCES um, presented, but they, you know, they, they would collect that information. So it is a, it's a lot of data collection. Um, I would not imagine that reviewing um, an articles of agreement would be extremely time consuming, um, but you know, we, we laid it out pretty specifically here. And, you know, when, when Beth was doing a ton of uh, work on this initially, we looked at a lot of other states and, you know, what is in the Articles of Agreement is not very different from different, like, from state to state. We mostly studied New England states, but, you know, uh, these exist in, uh, we're one of nine states in the United States that doesn't have an established system. So this is a, sure. a pretty, um, it, it's it's relatively standard in education or across the country. Yeah, I guess that was just my point was I think my my take on this is the bulk of the work will be with the districts, with their with their school boards, with their business directors, with their legal counsel. Like those will be the folks doing the heavy lifting. And the AOE is really just kind of like a report back, like a reporting structure. Um, but anyway, I also wanted to say thank you to Beth for running through this a second time really thoroughly, and I really appreciate it. Uh, okay. so that's, yeah, that's helpful. Us. Uh, when's the, the date that they have to all sort of consider the VOCES again? July 1, 2026. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah, so um, I appreciate everything that Hal said has done for this. I, I like the concept. I think that I think uh, everyone in both the House and the Senate are interested in uh, looking for cost reductions and efficiencies. I'm just, I'm going to take this kind of from a, a different perspective that uh, Vermont's been criticized as having uh, a very low admin to student ratio. I've seen the reports about, I mean, we're, we have like 10 times or more uh, admin to student ratio in a, in a ratio than just about anybody in the nation. So 
to me, there's an efficiency problem that can be addressed there. I'm not sure the BOC is the right vehicle to do that. I think this is just a gut feeling, and I don't have any research to back this up, but if the SUs can become more efficient, meaning a little more consolidation, that they could potentially address a lot of the efficiencies, potentially cost savings that are addressed, articulated for the vote seat without creating another layer of bureaucracy, which creates another layer of admin versus student ratio, which I think would have, would have the, the, the unintended consequence of decreasing that or decreasing that ratio. Uh, so I'm wondering if in house ed, you guys evaluated the trade-off between, and again, I'm gonna call it a super union, the supervisor unions that are grouped together as opposed to the votes. And if, if in fact you had any thoughts on that and if you, and what, what led you to swing towards the, the uh, concept of the votes? Yeah, thank you. That, that's a lot to unpack and um, it's a great question. What we looked at were a number of factors. Yes, SUs could, could likely do some of the work that they're already doing. That is absolutely for sure. Where it comes into um, conundrums is when there is uh, like a specialty speech therapist, or um, you know, you have someone that deals with extraordinary special education needs with a behavioral specialist, and and you have a, a, a an FTE of you know point two five, and a district next to them that wouldn't necessarily consolidate or already went through the consolidation factor. Um, like my school, uh, my district has consolidated and its elementary schools are 25 miles apart from one another. They're probably still not gonna consolidate because the, ge the geography is really strong, but they could share that FTE and that BOCES could do it as opposed to you've got a 0.25 contract over here and a 0.25 contract over here. That person can't get benefits because they're a part-time employee everywhere they are. So there's that factor. Um, the other piece is what the BOCES can do uh, in that statewide perspective of being able to share uh, professional development that could go to any school in the whole state um, that probably wouldn't happen if you are talking about Bennington talking to Chittenden County. Um, so we did, we did really like that. I appreciate the fact that we don't want to create additional administration. And so that's where that number seven could dramatically reduce um, I'd rather see that and try out the BOCES than to throw out BOCES due to administrative um, concerns, because I think that there's a, a lot to be done out there with, you know, community schools is a great example of the fact that uh, the AOE can't write that grant, and yet all of our districts are too small to do it on their own. And so to draw down that federal money for community schools, that's the perfect job for the BOCES. And it, it would be sad to have that um, option not available because there's no way that SUs can partner, I don't think, enough to do that. Yeah. So follow up. Again, it's, I understand all the benefits of those as far as, you know, a, a point, uh, two five FTE special educator. I, I get all that. But um, my, my, my question is a little different is instead of creating BOCES, why not conglomerate SUs together? To uh, to address to serve the same function, you know that, that that those special educators would work for the SU as opposed to the BOCE, or the SU super SU would do uh, purchasing on a wider scale or professional development on a wider scale, and that that super SU would be dealing with the other super SUs to find even further efficiencies. Like you stated, Bennington working with Chittenden for professional development or what have you. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if that was considered, that specifically, expanding the SUs. I think there are lots of people who probably want to expand the SUs. The path towards that becoming reality and the path towards the BOCES becoming activated is, uh, is a much different timeline. Um, and the BOCES allows us to be nimble and to react to our current state of world stress and our ed systems faster 
um, we did uh, when in special education, when there has been supervisory union to supervisory union collaboration thus far, there's been an extreme amount of savings. Uh, that's for sure. I, I'll just remind you, I, I think I said it, but I, I can't remember. Um, you know, out of place students, out of state place students, um, upwards of $200,000 in state student placement, 60,000 plus 30,000 in transportation costs for one student. We have a collaborative that is really close to one another doing that for $15,000 per student that includes transportation. So it's, I think it allows us to be really nimble to take that model and start to replicate it in a way that's easier than those SUs trying to figure it out from scratch. They just go to the BOCES and the BOCES plugs in place the, the, the next place for that to happen. So I, I respect where you're coming from, but I do think that the nimbleness of this and the, the quick uh, ability to respond to our current crisis is really important. Ms. St. James, how much time do we have with you? I have your hard stop. I don't have hard stop today. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to, if we could, we, we, we've heard from, I was just looking through the witnesses, we've heard from a lot of people on this. So I'll be curious if anybody has additional people they'd like to hear from besides the agency tomorrow. But I also know Senator Hashim has a comment or oh, question. Yeah. And Senator, if you would like to. No, I mean, I, I was. And we've got the bond bank. Regarding administration, it's, I mean, that was one of my initial concerns too. But I think in learning about how this would actually work. I don't see it as necessarily increasing administration, but either keeping it level or potentially reducing administration. I mean, I think a lot of examples were just given, but I'm just thinking about the fact, you know, so you have two SUs and they're just trying to figure out, all right, you got to figure out our bus situation. And, you know, instead of one SU doing the contracts and then the other SU doing its own individual contract, and duplicating that work instead, it's just that one, the BOCES entity, figuring it out for both SUs and thus reducing the amount of time that they're spending trying to figure out contracts and logistics with this, you know, with some private contractor or something like that. So, that is yeah, I, I, I just want to reiterate what Senator Pasheen said. I, that was exactly my understanding of what this could do. And to Senator Weeks's point about the administration, no, 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 that's for tomorrow. The, yeah, that's Senator yeah, Weeks' point you. about the thank you, high Marty. level, nope. the high level of administrators that we have. I actually see that this could lower the number of administrators we have, which you could potentially share in the rest districts. I mean, it says professional and other staff as part of the BOCES. So, anyway, like one business manager for yeah. Both SUs as opposed to a business manager and one SU and then another business yeah. manager and another SU. Or even assistant principal or whatever, AD, athletic director. Yeah. Okay, let's just take a, yeah, a few minutes uh, break. We'll come back to the bond bank. And that we're going to pick, we're going to ask Morgan, would you please uh, let the chair of Ed know that we're going to probably run about 10 minutes late? We're going to give Absolutely. the bond bank 20 minutes, so uh, maybe tell them to come in about five minutes before. Please. To respond to your question. Yeah. Other witnesses? Yeah. Are we still on? Yeah. Superintendent. So, so we did hear from them. You want to hear from them again? Yeah. Specific okay. to targeting them versus creating voices. Okay. That's that's. Morgan, would you have uh, Jeff Francis come in again on this issue? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. He did testify once, but we can. Uh, oh, we'll tell you what. Pause on that. No, okay. first test. I'll, I'll go back and listen. Okay. Hold off on that for now. Okay. Take five minutes. Time, time is of the essence. 